Now it's time to move into the next uh, session in the agenda. And I'd like to invite Councillor David Hodge to come and lead the session and to invite Secretary of State Greg Clark to also join Councillor Hodge, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome the, our Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Greg Clark, to the Local Government Conference. <clears throat> Greg, it has certainly been a very busy year for you with the enactment of the Cities and Local Government Devolution Act and the agreement of further devolution deals around the country. On behalf of the Local Government Association, I'd like to thank you and your ministerial team for being so accessible to us and for attending various local government association meetings over the past year, including the Councillors' Forum, the LJ Policy Boards, as well as our recent parliamentary reception. No doubt once you've spoken, Greg, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience in relation to issues such as business rates, devolution, and much more. However, before you start speaking, I, would, I wonder if you'd like if I posed a question of my own about something far more serious. I know you were born and brought up in Middlesbrough, and I'm sure that you're proud that your hometown team is now back in the Premiership playing at that wonderful Riverside Stadium. Whilst I'm confident that my club, Arsenal, is now guaranteed six points next season, I want to know whether you think Middlesbrough will be able to do a Leicester and win the Premiership. And do you know how much money you're going to put on? Because the current odds are 1,000 to 1. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of State. Well, that's an offer I can't refuse. I'll have to uh, have that order. But I think uh, John's presumably having something on Bournemouth as well. Uh, another uh, team in the uh, and, and town in the top flight in every respect. And it's great to, uh, to have John's welcome uh, today. Um, and can I say uh, to, to Mark, thanks so much for, uh, I think on behalf of everyone, for organising Richard Silgo and the Orpheus uh, uh, School to, uh, the Orpheus uh, team to, to come and play to us. It was the, I think, the perfect introduction to a conference. It got us uh, thinking about uh, what we're in this business for, which is to, to help the lives of people in our communities um, and to see the talent that was there that is being brought out and I think is uh, in these uh, rough times, uh, it is a very good overture to the conference that we have uh, today. Um, uh, David was uh, kind enough to mention um, the accessibility uh, of my ministerial team. Um, uh, most of them are here today, and the rest will be here tomorrow. Uh, so on the front row, we have uh, Susan Williams, my minister in the House of Lords. We have Marcus Jones, and we have Marc Francois. Uh, they will be here uh, all day and most of the week. Uh, and um, my two other colleagues, James Wharton uh, and Brandon Lewis, will be joining us uh, tomorrow. Uh, you're very welcome to talk to us uh, uh, at all stages, uh, in, the, uh, in the conference sessions, uh, and especially in the bar, especially if, um, uh, if drinks are provided to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, lubricate those discussions. But it's, uh, we always look forward to, uh, to the informal discussions that we have here. Now, colleagues, we, we do, of course, meet in circumstances that, as Gary said, um, a year ago, few of us would have expected. The United Kingdom resolved to leave the European Union. The Prime Minister, only recently re-elected, resigned, and a contest to replace him already underway. The principal party of opposition contemplating a second contest within a year for the post of leader. In these turbulent times, it's more appropriate than ever to be grateful for the stability and confidence that local government brings to our national life. Because while some Westminster politicians can give a good impression of losing their heads and blaming it on everyone else, that doesn't wash in local government. In fact, when the LGA had a spot of political instability after the local elections in May, it was resolved amicably 
in a matter of days. And in my time negotiating 27 city deals, 39 growth deals, and 10 devolution deals uh, with leaders uh, of all political parties and none in all parts of the country. I've never had the slightest difficulty uh, in finding common ground between people who were dedicated to serving their local residents. And one of the reasons that I've always been passionate about getting power out of the hands of central government and into yours is that there is a practicality and a directness in local government. You focus on the job in hand. Local government is agile, dependable, hands-on. As the author Benjamin Barber put it in the American context, presidents pontificate, mayors pick up the garbage, literally and metaphorically. So let me thank you and through you all your fellow members and officers, not just for picking up the garbage, though my predecessor set great store by that, but also for educating our children, for giving security and respect to our elderly people, for making those who would be left out of society welcomed in, for catching people when they fall into homelessness uh, or debt or despair, for providing refuge from, for people fleeing violence, whether perpetrated in their home uh, or from brutal regimes on the other side of the world. Thank you for helping our cities, towns and counties uh, to be better places to live and to work and to do business through your hard work in making them more attractive making them greener, cleaner, and healthier. Thank you for running a planning system that brings you no end of brickbats, uh, as I know, but which has, for the first time in decades, produced planning permissions which match the growing population. Thanks for keeping our roads running, which certainly know if you didn't, our parks beautiful, and our neighborhoods safe. And it's not just the things that have to be done every day. Local government proves time and time again as being exceptionally agile at dealing with the unexpected. In December last year, floods struck the north of England. The first to respond, alongside the emergency services, were the officers and lead members of local authorities, as I know from all of the time uh, that I spent in the area uh, during those months. They worked round the clock for days on end. Christmas holidays literally washed away to evacuate the people affected, to check on those who were isolated, to get money and help to people and businesses who needed it. I want to thank everyone who came to the rescue of our communities in their hour of need. I'd like to thank, uh, in the LGA, I'd like to thank Gary for his great leadership uh, over the past year. Uh, and the, the group leaders, uh, David Hodge, uh, here with us on the platform, uh, Nick Forbes, Gerald Vernon-Jackson, and Marianne Elverton in the front row with us. Uh, Nick, of course, uh, took over from Jim McMahon, to whom we send our best wishes. Uh, he moved from local government to parliament during the year, almost trampled in the stampede of members of the shadow cabinet rushing the other way. But despite that, life goes on. Uh, we are uh, gathered together to talk about some of the biggest issues uh, that face us. Let me talk about that matter uh, of Europe. And I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're about to have in the next session, uh, where you're going to be giving your uh, advice and reflections, which I will uh, take account of and feed into the discussions we have in government. I think the first thing to say uh, is that whether we're in uh, local government or national government, government is about leadership. We have the responsibility to keep a cool head. The referendum was an instruction to negotiate terms for leaving the EU. Nothing has changed yet and should not, in my view, until we have a clear view of the change that we want. We're still members of the single market. We're still members of European councils with full voting rights. People from other European countries have a perfect right to come and live and work here. The second thing that I think we need to reflect on is that it's essential that we conduct ourselves with the courtesy and the respect, which not only is a hallmark uh, of Britain's reputation, but is obviously an essential condition for any successful negotiation. Our European neighbors must continue to be our partners uh, and must also continue to be our friends. Our society and our communities must be open, tolerant, and welcoming. The Polish men who fought the Luftwaffe were made welcome here. The Polish and European men and women who've come more recently and who contribute to our national life, you too are welcome here. To those 
who come to us because they've fled persecution and to whom we have offered sanctuary. You are welcome here. And just because we have voted to leave the European Union does not mean that we should abandon our international outlook, our openness to the world, our strength in being one of the most diverse, welcoming, and civilized places on the planet. I'm very proud of the work that my department supports and that many of you lead on in tackling hate crime specifically. We must redouble those efforts on behalf not just of those members of our society who've been subjected to sickening abuse uh, in recent days, but to the whole of Britain whose repugnance at the behavior of an unrepresentative few must prevail. I think that the referendum did not so much create divisions in our country uh, as expose ones that were already there. London voting to remain, most of the rest of England for out. Some metropolitan cities voting marginally to stay in, smaller industrial towns voting heavily to leave. There was a critique that was made during the campaign of the European Union, uh, whether we think it's accurate or not, and it was that it was too remote, too unaccountable, too bureaucratic, trying to be too uniform, run by people who don't know what it's like for me where I am. Now, traveling around the country, talking to people uh, during the last year and during that campaign, I get a sense that some of those charges were leveled at the way our country is run too. So among the answers to the challenge that the referendum poses has to be, it seems to me, a much bigger role for the local in our national life. <laughs> local government that is rooted in communities, that is practical and pragmatic, not doctrinaire, that understands the communities that comprise an area and the differences uh, between one place and another. Local government that has local powerful leadership. Our great towns and cities over the centuries have been led by, and in some cases founded by, people who've had the ability, but also the freedom to pursue a bold vision for their city, town, or county. To be proud of it, and incidentally, to care little for being told what to do uh, by people at a national level. Uh, it's always the case uh, that local leaders uh, put national leaders in their place. Uh, David mentioned that Middlesbrough uh, is my hometown. And one of my favorite stories about the, the early days of Middlesbrough uh, was when the, the Prince of Wales came uh, in 1887, uh, I think it was, to, to open the new town hall. Um, and uh, in, the, in his speech, uh, the heir to the throne admitted with a slightly condescending tone, that he'd come to Middlesbrough and he expected to see a smoky town, uh, as he put it. Uh, now, the mayor, in his uh, response, conservative mayor as it happens, uh, instantly and publicly upbraided the heir to the throne. Uh, and he said, his royal highness owned that he had expected to see a smoky town. It is one. And if there's one thing more than another that Middlesbrough can be said to be proud of, it is that smoke. The smoke is an indication of plenty of work, uh, and the account uh, in Asa Briggs' uh, biography uh, indicates applause from the crowd uh, at this point. An indication of prosperous times, cheers, an indication that all classes of work people are being employed, that there is little necessity for charity, cheers, and that even in those, humble, in those in the humblest of stations are free from want, cheers. Therefore, we are proud of our smoke, cheers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if Middlesbrough in its infancy can, um, can speak up like that to, uh, uh, to the heir to the throne, I think we need to revive that spirit uh, of, uh, of ambition, of leadership, and uh, a reluctance to be told what to do uh, by anyone uh, across the country. Uh, local leaders should be uh, assertive and proud, uh, and in our response to leaving the European Union, we have to insist on a radically expanded role for local government. Uh, that means that, in my view, we need to be represented at the negotiating table. Uh, when the Prime Minister made his statement on the, the morning uh, of the general election result, he was very clear uh, that the, the nations, uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, should be part of the negotiating team. Now, the moment I heard that, uh, I knew that uh, local government in England needed to be part of that team too. Uh, and so I've argued successfully uh, with my colleagues in government uh, during the last week for English local government to be part of the negotiations on the terms of our exit. Uh, that has now been agreed, 
Uh, and in the days ahead, I'm going to ask Gary to put together a team representing all parts uh, of local government, all parties and all parts of the country to make sure that we make good use of this seat at the table. When we're transferring powers from the EU to Britain, I think it's essential that Whitehall is not the default destination for them. For years, we've been urging subsidiarity, the principle that power should be held as close to the people as possible. We've been urging that on the European Union. Now is the time to apply it at home and ask first whether the powers and funds uh, that we are repatriating from the European level can be transferred to local government. I also think it's essential that we confirm uh, as quickly as possible the continued availability of structural funds which co-fund many important investments in infrastructure and economic development, including in the North, the Midlands, and the Southwest. The program runs from 2014 to 2020. Uh, and in my view, it would be madness to put at risk major job-creating projects when they're already underway and very much needed in these parts of the country. Although you could be forgiven for thinking so, uh, there are, of course, uh, other matters that Gary uh, and David talked about uh, that we need to discuss during this week uh, here at Bournemouth, uh, apart from uh, the relationship with the EU. Now, the Communities and Local Government Select Committee in Parliament um, used to fret uh, every year in the past about whether the department's agenda was prominent enough uh, in government. That's not a question they ask anymore. During the last 12 months, local government has played a more prominent and influential role in government policy than I can remember. Ten devolution deals for combined authorities have been negotiated, covering 30% of the population of England. Local government will retain 100% of business rates from 2019-20 and will be financially independent of central government. Every part of England is on the point of submitting proposals for the Local Growth Fund, which I launched in 2014 and which is now driving growth uh, right across the country. There is much more to do, and I'm determined that you should drive the reforms uh, that are needed. During the last few months, uh, I've been working closely with the group leaders and officers in the LGA on how to make sure that business rates at retention uh, is implemented in a way that is fair and effective to all types of councils in all type parts of the country. I've argued strongly in government that we should get on with the preparations, we shouldn't pause them, and specifically that we should invite local government through the LGA to recommend its, your preferred solution. So I can announce today that I'm publishing the official consultation on business rates retention that will allow us to continue this momentum for reform. The consultation is deliberately broad and open rather than being narrowly prescriptive because I want to give ample space for all colleagues here uh, to shape the solution that we arrive at. Uh, there's a major opportunity uh, for us that we should all seize together. There's another opportunity that I think is very necessary for us to, uh, to grapple with, uh, which is to transform the way in which the NHS and local councils work together uh, for the care of the elderly and the vulnerable uh, in our society. In the local government financial settlement that I negotiated with the Treasury, we were able to secure a proposal that was made to be by local government, the 2% social care precept. Uh, and the figures out last week show that it's already raised £308 million extra for investment in social care in its first year. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the new, uh, the improved Better Care Fund, which will be available to local government to improve social care. But I'm very well aware that there is further to go. At its best, local NHS bodies work efficiently with local councils to ensure that hospital patients and elderly residents, who after all are one and the same people, are helped to get the best care they can in the most appropriate setting. But too often, in my experience, this is the exception rather than the rule. And the boundaries of the NHS have proved to be too often impregnable. And that genuine, full-hearted collaboration that's necessary uh, has been lacking. That must change, culturally as much as structurally. And so I will redouble the efforts to work with the Health Secretary to support any area here that brings forward new ways of working that can help improve social care. I will help ensure that you're not held back because it hasn't been done before or because it hasn't been national policy or because budgets held by health providers have proved elusive to local government. Now is the time during the next 12 months when we need to make the case for devolution uh, in the, the, the area of health 
uh, and social care, just as we have uh, in the case of economic development. Colleagues, I thanked you earlier for the transformation that you've made in providing the planning permissions that we need to provide the homes uh, for the next generation. But while the number of planning permissions uh, incre has increased, um, the number of new homes actually built has increased, but not at the same pace. We need to close this gap. There's nothing more frustrating, I know, to you, as well as to me, than seeing a plot that you've granted planning permission for, taking years to be built out. So we need together to, to speed up the implementation of planning permissions. One of the ways in which we can do that is to provide smaller sites uh, or subdivide bigger sites so that they are available to the small and medium-sized local and regional builders who literally built the Britain that we're familiar with today, uh, but whose balance sheets and access to finance has put them at a disadvantage when it comes to acquiring large sites. Since the uh, financial crash uh, at the end of the, the last decade, the share of small and medium-sized builders fell uh, and has been held uh, at much small, too small a level uh, than is uh, best for our country uh, and best for our communities, and we need to turn that around. At the spending review, we secured £20 billion for investment in house building, and I'm determined to work with you so that we can, in partnership, turn around the 30-year deficit in house building that's caused so much anguish for so many millions of young people who want only to have what our generation was able to do with confidence, which was to count on a home of their own. We have important further work to do on devolution. The devolution deals that we have agreed, as I said, cover a third of the country by population, but they are very much available to the whole of the country. No place is the same, and no deal should be the same. The geography and powers and governance that are right for one place will not be right for another. But in every case, I will look for local agreement, not central imposition. Now, I know that in many cases, it would seem easier to have a standard blueprint and compel authorities to adopt it. But if you believe in devolution as I do, that would be to miss the whole point. I will not compel any council to join any devolution arrangement. It needs to be locally agreed. But in a Britain in which the question has changed from whether to devolve to how significantly to devolve, there is a huge opportunity for leaders uh, in this room who are willing to work together in harmony to take powers and budgets which can be used to magnify the impact of their existing leadership on the lives of their residents. Now, Mr. Chairman, Gary, conference, uh, in at least three political parties now, the Conservative Party, the Green Party, and UKIP, there is a leadership contest underway. And if Labour were to join, it would make it four. Who knew a year ago that Tim Farron would become one of the few points of certainty in our national life? <laughs> but my advice to local governments in these leadership contests uh, is not to take the newfound resurgence of interest in local government for granted. For many years, devolution to local government was com campaigned for locally uh, and by this conference, but was thwarted nationally uh, by ministers and officials in national government. Some departments of government are recent converts, but in the recent past, they were the most implacable opponents. It matters uh, who the party leader is, whichever, the member, whichever party uh, you're a member of. Uh, it matters uh, who the local government secretary is or his shadow. But it also matters who the Chancellor is. It matters who the Health Secretary is. It matters who the Transport Secretary is. It matters who the Welfare Secretary is, and so forth and so on. A year ago, I said I wanted to see a nation of muscular communities. Now is the time to exercise that muscle, to challenge the leadership candidates on their commitment to local government leading our economy through the challenges of a world outside the EU. Colleagues, on the 23rd of June, the United Kingdom made a momentous decision. But it's a decision that gives rise to immediate challenges that we need to rise to as a nation. How we can have a closer connection between citizens and government. How we can bring hope and prosperity to every community. How we can celebrate, not suppress, people's yearning for a sense of place. How we can build communities that are diverse, tolerant, and that people are proud to be part of how we can replace bureaucracy with simplicity, how we can run our country uh, in a way that is practical, direct, and dependable. It seems to me that the answer to so many of these challenges 
uh, is to continue to double up uh, on the efforts that we've been making uh, to have stronger, more powerful, more prominent local government. And the manner of the leadership of that local government uh, is crucial too. At this time of tension and apprehension, why add to the stresses and strains when you can ease them? Why divide when you can unite? Why edge for difference when you can seek the common ground? Everyone in this hall has a part to play in bringing our country together for a bright future. You're needed now more than ever. I'm grateful for everything you've done during the year past and everything that you will do during the weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me and look forward to the rest of the conference. Okay, um, thank you, Greg, for those uh, words, and uh, I'm sure many of us will make sure that we will not let Greg down, and I'm sure he will not let us down as we move forward together. We're going to have a couple of questions now. I'm going to do it in threes, is that okay? Yeah. So, anybody who doesn't understand the threes, that means one, two, three, okay? Um, so, where have we got pe people? Can you do that lady over there? She's had her hand up. Number four. Uh, and then if I can see the others, please. Okay. Yes, please. I did realize I was gonna be first. Inbound for North East Somerset, along with South Gloucester and Bristol, we are launching a consultation on governance for a combined authority, uh, one that covers much of the old Avon authority. So Mr. Clark, can you assure us that devolution as currently being offered to such combinations of local authorities no, no, is not a means to reorganization of local government? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, I, I am looking. I'm trying to see where the microphones have all disappeared. To. Can we take a microphone, please, down to the end here on the right? And then over there. Who's got a microphone, please? If you've got a board and a microphone, please find somebody. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I th the question I had previously, uh, Greg, has really been answered about the fact that there's never been a better time for devolution and working together. The question now is really, can we accelerate that process and can we have some uh, certainty that your colleagues within the rest of government have your enthusiasm? Because actually, I think this is absolutely, as you say, a unique time for us to work together mm -hmm. and get on with this. Mm -hmm. uh, and with your help, I'm sure we can. Does anybody in the number one, two, or three holding? Have you got one up there? Top, there? Yes, please. Go ahead. Number one. Thank you. Uh, Becky Shaw from East Sussex County County Council. I was privileged this morning to be part of a conversation with the rest of the Chief Execs group. And uh, my question comes from all of us. Uh, local government has repeatedly demonstrated its resilience um, and our willingness to rise to the challenge. Please don't necessarily take us for granted forever. Uh, given the uncertain times that councils find ourselves in, uh, we play a really <coughs> pivotal role for our residents, for our businesses and for our workforces. We know that we deliver at our very best when we work together. So how does the panel think with capacity so stretched we can best continue to all work together collaboratively to have the greatest impact on our residents and economies. Great. Okay, okay let me take the three together. So, uh, from Bath and North East Somerset, uh, are we going to recreate uh, Avon? And I dare say it's equivalents uh, all across the country. Well, if there's the one thing that, um, uh, that you uh, inhale when you walk into the, to the door of the Department of Communities and Local Government is the... Um, uh, is the uh, the stench of, um, of failure of attempts from the top down to to impose lines on the map uh, on local government and to order uh, people to to follow it it never works uh, and there's no uh, there's no advantage to it people quite rightly resist being told what to do and I think the uh, what I said in my remarks about the uh, the appetite to be governed locally in a way that is more consistent with what people want locally, uh, I think needs to be 
uh, needs to be asserted. Um, so uh, I have no intention whatever uh, of obliging the reorganization of local government. What I will do uh, is to uh, facilitate for those of you that want to come forward with proposals uh, to uh, work together in combined authorities and to take uh, powers uh, and resources from central government. Uh, I, as I've done over the last few years, both in the growth deals uh, and in the recent devolution deals, I will make your case uh, to colleagues uh, in government to make that happen. But I will never uh, impose uh, an arrangement that <coughs> I've cooked up uh, myself. Uh, in terms of the opportunity to, to accelerate uh, the process, I think this is a big moment uh, for us in local government. There are uh, powers uh, and budgets. I mentioned the, the structural funds uh, that have been uh, allocated uh, at a European level. They've had some involvement of local uh, authorities. But I think rather than see them lost in Whitehall, uh, this is the opportunity for them to go to uh, the genuinely local level. And using the seat at the table that the sector uh, now has, uh, I want us to be there from the outset to, uh, to increase uh, the, the possibilities that exist uh, for local uh, government and local leadership uh, and to increase the, the pace uh, of, uh, of devolution. Uh, and in terms of uh, Becky's point about um, taking local government uh, for granted, uh, we can't. I mean, all of the services uh, that you are responsible for delivering uh, with such demonstrated effectiveness year after year, it is literally the case that the country uh, could not be run effectively without your local leadership. Uh, and it seems to me it's not, a, it's not an act of altruism to, uh, to want to, uh, to back local government and to, to see it uh, prosper. It's in our national self-interest and it's essential uh, that we should. Uh, does everyone in, in government uh, and in Whitehall uh, share my uh, enthusiasm and my determination to devolve? To be candid, no. Uh, and that's why uh, I would encourage you, uh, not just during the leadership contests, but now uh, you, I think, see the, the direction, see the possibilities are there, to be ever more assertive, to be ever more clear on what you can uh, offer and what you can propose and how the country as well as your areas will be better for it. Okay, number two and number three and then number four over here again, please. Have you got anybody up there? No, okay. Number four. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Keely, I'm Have you got anybody? Council. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, ask a simple question really is, um, you, you said earlier that strong local leadership is vital now and should be at the forefront of what comes next in terms of the EU exit. Um, can I ask that local councils are around the negotiating table rather than Brussels uh, dictating and also central government and in down uh, instructions to us? We need to be at that negotiating table. Thank you. Okay. Uh, last question, anybody? No? Okay. I haven't got a mic for you, sorry. Okay, go on, up the top. Number one, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and uh, absolutely delighted to uh, see and, and hear Greg's views about uh, the, the very strong local leadership provided by local governments. I'm Jamil Malik, uh, work for Place of People Group, mm. one of the largest housing associations in the country. So my question is, what's your views, Greg, about combining and amplifying the local leadership that's provided by housing companies like mine and local authorities. Thank you. Okay, let me take those two. The simple answer to John's um, question is yes, you will. You now have a place at the table. It was essential that you should. Uh, and now it's for everyone here. This is the ideal week to be, uh, to be setting out your agenda to, to use in those negotiations. You will be part of those negotiations. Uh, as I say, I'll ask Gary uh, and Mark to, uh, to form uh, a panel so that everyone represented in this room can feed in and can help shape those discussions. This is something that we need to grasp the opportunity to make a big push for, uh, for local government. Um, Jamel's point on, uh, on housing companies and, and housing uh, <coughs> associations. Uh, listen, I want to see a, a much more prominent role for, uh, for councils uh, and housing associations uh, in building the homes that we need. Uh, I don't think it is, uh, it's, it's not at all acceptable or desirable that the, uh, the domination uh, of the house building sector 
uh, by a relatively small number of the biggest uh, players uh, should be there unchallenged. They've got a very important job to do. They, they supply a lot of homes. But you want to have a, a mixed economy there. You want to have competition. You want to have diversity. You want to have um, local uh, initiative. And so we need to have uh, more competitors and more players. <coughs> local authorities can play a big role in that. Housing associations can play a big role in that. Uh, and uh, the best uh, housing associations are already uh, ambitious and uh, diverse in what they uh, can offer locally. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think there is an opportunity uh, to do uh, between authorities, and it's also happening between associations, uh, is working together in concert so that you can have a bigger impact uh, than you can on your own. Not to say that you should lose your, uh, your sovereignty, but there are opportunities to, uh, to work together, whether neighboring boroughs, uh, neighboring authorities, hand-in-hand uh, in hand, uh, with housing associations sometimes, to make sure that the uh, the funds that are available, 20 billion, uh, the biggest uh, investment uh, that we've, uh, we've made in, in housing since the 1970s, uh, is not, uh, doesn't slip through your fingers, but it's something that you can make a real difference with uh, for your communities. Uh, we'll have, I think, a lot of opportunity to talk about housing uh, throughout the, the next few uh, days here, uh, but more still during the year ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that. And I am sorry I wasn't able to get more questions in, but we are about eight minutes over time. But I would just like to, to ask you to show our appreciation for Greg Clark, who clearly is a secretary to say who cares about local government. Just so that everyone's aware, we're, we're going into the next section, which I'm going to hand over to the Chief Executive, that both Greg and his Minister team are actually going to be sitting in the front row listening to the questions that are coming from the floor, which I think is a really important point. You know, it's about how we as councillors can also learn to listen. So can I hand over to the Chief Executive? Th th thank you, Councillor Hodge. We're just going to <coughs> change the panel on the top table, then we'll go straight into the next session. So bear with us one moment.